Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us for the midweek service. We're going to talk a little bit about today of uh, this incredible moment that Jesus talks to his disciples, in this case the apostles, and he gives them authority. He breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit and I'm going to give you authority to bind up and to hold on to, to forgive sins or to retain sins. And so it really comes down to a measure of authority given to those particular apostles and how we look at authority in the church today. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that, but we're going to begin with prayer. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, God make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is a unity unto itself, to which the tribes go up and the tribes of the Lord, the assembly of Israel itself, to praise the name of the Lord. For there are the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and quietness within your towers. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will pray for your prosperity. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek to do you good. Lord Jesus, give us peace of the new Jerusalem. Bring all nations into your kingdom to share your gifts, that they may render thanks to you without end, and may come to your eternal city, where you live and you reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. From the book of Malachi is a reading from the book of the book of the Hebrew scripture. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations. And in every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations. Thus says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. be with you and also with you the holy gospel of our lord jesus christ according to john glory to you lord jesus christ when it was evening on that day the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the jews jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I do want to talk to you today about authority because this is, goes back a little before, obviously, the resurrection. Jesus is doing, again, his farewell discourses in the Gospel of John. He's talking to his disciples and he breathes on them. And he talks to them and says, receive the Holy Spirit because I'm giving you authority. You know, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. You know, the sins you retain, you know, are also retained in heaven. And he's basically giving them the authority over what goes on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of authority. And I want to differentiate it a little bit from power to authority. Most of us have traveled to the United States at one time or another. And that means because we are northern people, occasionally we go down there for the warm weather in the winter time, or we just go down as tourists to visit uh, people we, maybe we know or family, whatever. And if we've traveled to the United States, when you come to the border and you cross over into the United States, the first thing you do is come to a border station where there is a border guard, an American. And the one thing you might notice very quickly about American border guards is 
they have a gun strapped to their side, usually a revolver of some kind strapped to their side. And it's a little bit intimidating. Um, it's very intimidating to me because I think to myself, why do they need a gun if they're just asking you questions and you're crossing over the border? But they do. And maybe it has to do with the American past. You know, they had the Wild West and they fought two major wars on their soil. And they have this big thing about guns, about authority with guns. And guns speak for them in many ways. And it's funny because when you cross back into Canada, the one thing you do notice about Canadian border guards is they don't have guns. And so what is the authority when you cross borders? Is it the nation itself? Or is it the idea that somehow the border guard in the United States is a gun to back up his or her authority? That somehow that gives them a sense of power and authority over those who cross over the border? I don't know, but I think it's, it raises a good question. There are huge differences sociologically between our two countries. And part of that is the love affair Americans seem to have with guns, but also the idea that somehow authority comes with a sense of power, and it comes with a sense that they can control the events that are given to them. Now, when Jesus breathes on his followers, he's saying, receive this authority, if you will, because what you're going to bind on earth is bind on earth, and it's going to be bound in heaven. You know, what you retain on earth is going to be retained in heaven. I'm giving you that ability. But it's not necessarily a power authority. It's authority to say, what is the church? What is the love of God? What is God's message? You have the authority to pass out, to share, and to make it relevant for today. Christian Canada is facing um, a huge challenge. Christianity in Canada has seen recent years the closure of many churches, uh, the shortlistings of many clergy. Now, I just read recently that in the Diocese of Quebec in the Roman Catholic Church, that some 150 churches have been closed, and they are reducing that pastoral care down to very few churches because the attendance has been so low. The United Church of Canada has been closing churches in a large number over the last few years. And we, within our Anglican Church, are facing a very difficult future. In fact, uh, many statistics say that the year 2040 or 2050, there'll be fewer and fewer and fewer of us. And that somehow we have to deal with that future. Well, you and I know the challenges. You and I know what the world is like today. Um, it's not just the crises of the church, it's the lifestyle changes that we've all gone through. Uh, there is more and more of a sense that people can do what they want to do and have what they want to have. Cellular phones have changed the way we communicate. There's no question about it. We can communicate by texting or speaking to people we know or love. We also know that we are a consumer society and consumption has been a very tested quantity throughout this COVID-19, where we have been unable to go to stores, but Amazon and other mail order people have filled in the blanks so that we can still consume in major ways. There is attempts by us along the way in the last, since the 1960s, when people began to walk away, in a sense, from organized religion, we've tried to bring them back with all kinds of things. Uh, Pope John XXIII called an ecumenical council during the 60s to say, how, how do we become relevant again to our church people? How do we find relevancy in the Catholic Church? And the Vatican Council went through years of discussions and came out with its documents. And in those documents and in the ensuing changes that happened in the Catholic Church, they tried to definitely make themselves relevant to new generations of Christian people. They changed the worship, uh, they updated the language and moved from Latin to the vernacular language of the country. Uh, they brought in new music, uh, they sort of took down all of the huge um, offers of the church in terms of, of its religious symbolism and tried to bring it down to the common people. And, but that was a cosmetic change. And we of our churches have all tried to do the same thing. We've tried to be more relevant to society. We've tried desperately to be more inclusive of society. We've tried to make the message simpler to understand 
and perhaps reach your younger people and young people to bring them into the church and return them to the church. We even tried things like come back to church Sundays. But most of our changes, again, have been cosmetic, I would say. They're, they're just, you know, some simple changes, but they're not enough. What we've probably needed to do is press the reset button, just like on your computer, to reset ourselves and to bring us back to Jesus Christ. And if you remember a few years ago, the church came out with these little wristbands that said, you know, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Uh, and they were little things that sort of reminded us that we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are not the church, you know, in divorced from him, an organization that is basically conservative, that tries to hold its property and tries to hold on to its past. We are in fact the church of Jesus Christ. So what would he do? And what would he say? And how do we begin to recover that? Well, Jesus is giving authority to his apostles, to those who follow him. And that authority is really a responsibility. I want to use that word interchangeably, if you will, with authority. Responsibility, in capital letters almost. He's saying you're responsible for the faith. You're responsible to take that out into the world, to bind up what can be bound, and to also you know, retain or not retain as you choose. But I'm giving you that responsibility, that authority to in a sense do the work of the church and to be the church in the world. Now that's a huge, huge responsibility. And what happened in the past has not always been right. Uh, and during the Middle Ages, the institutions of the church became very powerful and very rich. Even monks and nuns who had been serving the poor became so rich and so powerful, they had servants and basically serfs who did their work and they just themselves relaxed with wealth. And same with bishops and archbishops and all of those people. They became part of a power structure of the Middle Ages. And therefore, they were not doing the work of Jesus. They were simply becoming engaging themselves. And that has happened into our own time, where we have TV pastors who are constantly asking for money and donations and have become very wealthy millionaires. And what does that say to young people and other people? What does it say to the world that somehow the Christian church has used and abused them along the way to make people rich and powerful? You know, the responsibility of being the church, of being the people in authority, we should have said something. In fact, it was the late Archbishop Lewis Garnsworthy of this Diocese of Toronto who said the day will come when we'll have to challenge that. We'll have to challenge these people who are using Jesus Christ for their own profit. And we haven't done it yet. Recently, the Russian Orthodox Patriarch got in some of the news I was watching because the Ecumenical Patriarch, that's the great Archbishop down in um, what's now Istanbul, but used to be Constantinople. He's called the Ecumenical Patriarch because he's the one who oversees the whole Orthodox Eastern Church in a sense. They are each autonomous, but he has an overview as the ecumenical patriarch. He was offering the Ukrainian Orthodox Church their own patriarch in separation from Moscow. Now, Moscow in the Russian Orthodox Church has always been the first patriarchate, the first bishops, if you will, of that church. And the Ukrainians wanted their own because now they've received their own physical, political independence. And the ecumenical patriarch said, well, you know, that's okay. Maybe you can have your own patriarch. Well, Moscow was very upset and threatened to, uh, in fact, to excommunicate not only those people in the Ukraine who followed this, but some others who were doing other things. And the threat of excommunication was about breaking the church, the Orthodox Church, somehow along the way. Now, what that does is makes it sound like a tempest in a teapot, because the average person doesn't really care. And it sounds, again, like the church is being kind of a person talking to itself. Uh, C.S. Lewis warned us and said years ago that the future of the church is really endangered because the danger is that you and I can become like little old people talking to themselves in a corner. That's what the church can become. And that's what this kind of thing says to the world. Here are bishops and archbishops, patriarchs, others, just simply excommunicating each other over authority and saying, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. It makes us look 
almost ridiculous in a sense to the world around us. You know, why were we talking to ourselves and to a talking in terms that the rest of the world really doesn't care? And somewhere along the way, they're making the church irrelevant. They're saying we're not really relevant to the world around us. We have to become relevant to the world once again. And the only way we can somehow become relevant is to bring Jesus back into the, the conversation. Bring him back into the conversation and say, what would Jesus say? What would Jesus do? Because our authority and our responsibility comes from him. When he breathed on us and made us the church, he gave us that ability. He gave us that responsibility and that authority to do so. I look in the mirror every morning, and when I look in the morning every morning uh, mirror, I look and I say, um, sit. I look and I say, my gosh, I have really changed. Um, because my hair is no longer dark, it is now white or gray. I look at my beard and say, well, I hate to shave, so I've let that grow. My skin's become kind of patchy, you know, what we call, the, we used to call liver spots, you know, where you, on your hands and your face, you get these little dark spots because I'm growing old and I'm changing all the time. I'm changing and changing means that you and I can't get away from the fact that there will be shifts in our lives and there'll be shifts in the world. Countries are becoming different. People are becoming different. And somehow the world has changed so much around us in communication, in science, in awareness of space and time, that we have to remain somehow relevant to all of this. We have to recognize change happens. And Jesus will always be relevant. But the church may not be relevant. Because the church, if it talks to itself, if it just loses itself in conversation, will not be relevant to the world in which we live. Jesus is always relevant. Jesus is incredible because he talks to the reality of all of those things that still confront us, whether it's racial injustice or peace in the world or somehow looking after those who need our help. In the midst of a COVID-19, we can almost hear him saying, you know, get out there and heal and touch and take responsibility for this world in which you are part. Please take the time to be the authority that I'm giving you, to be a calling that brings people together and shares the love of God. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that when I was a uh, jail chaplain, I had to take an oath of calling me to be an officer of the court. Being an officer of the court in Ontario is saying that I will not only obey, but I will try to always enforce and be part of the, enforcing the laws of Ontario, the Queen's laws. And I take that oath of allegiance to the Queen and to upholding the laws of Ontario. I did a wedding recently, and at the wedding, one of the people involved was a lawyer. And we're supposed to, under Ontario law, keep it to 10 people. Um, keep it to, to 10 people in attendance, and also to say there are no receptions. Well, it turned out that a couple more people snuck in. And I turned to the lawyer and I said, you know, you and I have taken an oath to uphold the law. And there are now more people than the law said. There are now 10, more than 10 people here. And he said, oh, you can, you can just let that go. But I take that oath very seriously that somehow the law is there to protect us in the midst of COVID-19, of the coronavirus, it is important that we follow somehow the authority, to, to use that authority and not to abuse it. Authority has been given to you, Jesus said. Authority has been given to you. Responsibility has been given to you. And you are to see that responsibility as part of really your ministry. You are responsible in this world of ours when fighting is going on in the Middle East, you are meant to bring peace. When hatred is there of people who are different color, different religion, you are there to uphold always the love of God. When people are singled out in anger because they're Asian or because they're Jewish or because of one thing or another, you are there to make a difference. The life of George Floyd is echoing still through our society in the world, not just in the United States. But injustice echoes in many ways. We are here to uphold not just law, but uphold the responsibility and the authority of the love of God in Jesus Christ. We are here to make a difference in our world. I do think we have to reset our buttons in terms of what the church is and what the church could be.
because we're living in a society today where the wealthy are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer where housing has become a huge issue just to simply survive. We're trying to find housing for those in need. The church has property that can turn into all kinds of things. The church has all kinds of responsibility to share the wealth of God in people who are in need. Maybe we have to go back to Jesus somewhere along the way and back to those early saints, my favorite, of course, Francis of Assisi, and say our responsibility, our authority, is for those who are in need. And we're given that by Jesus Christ. We can make a difference. And by making a difference, we can make the world a better place. I want to leave you with one little story that happened to me. And maybe it's a parable of what we should be and can be. There was a little town in uh, central Ontario that I was looking after along with two other little churches. And that particular church was dying. They only had about nine or ten people coming on a Sunday. But... I came regularly and I brought an organist with me and we had services. That church had a chance to say, do we want to survive or not? So I said to them, look, what's the future here? Do you want to be the church of Jesus Christ or don't you? Because I'm not going to just come here to do services. You've got to make a difference in this community or not. They said, give us a month to think about this and pray about it. And they did. And they came back to me and said, you know, we want to put on a weekly get together for the whole community, because it's a small community, but we can do it in our parish hall, and we can provide soup, and one of, people, one of the priest persons also made cabbage rolls. He said, we're gonna do our cabbage rolls and our soup, and whatever money people wanna leave, they'll leave, but not for the church, but for the betterment of the poor. And that meant buying good food boxes so that people could, who were poor could get some food brought to them, which were good food boxes were raw vegetables and canned goods and other things for those people in the community who were poor. So we did so. And it started maybe with 15 to 20 people coming to the fact that we had to basically uh, save places and do two or three sittings. And we collected so much money that we could, in fact, buy uh, up to 15 uh, good food boxes for distribution to the poor in the community. And the church grew. The church grew from 9 or 10 people to doubled its size to over 20 people. And for the first time in something like 30 years, they had a baptism of a child in that little church. It's a parable to say, if we are doing the work of Jesus Christ, then we will grow. And I do believe that. And I do believe that we're out there where there are poor and sick and needy people, we have a call. Where there are homeless people or people striving just to get a home over their head, a roof over their head, we can do great things in the name of Jesus. So we're not doomed to failure. We're challenged to be all we can be because we've been given that responsibility. We've been given that authority. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we can make a difference. Amen. Let us pray. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Comfort us in all our affliction. Defend us from all error. Lead us into all truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. May the challenge of Jesus Christ be a challenge and a call to us to act, to share, and to be the hands and heart of Jesus in this world. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God.